I think about is just the pace of technological change. And we're seeing it now with, with AI for sure. But the pace of change is so rapid. It's exciting to see because there are so many endless possibilities and potential for things that this industry in particular does a really poor job of when it comes to efficiency and data and utilization of technology. Hey, everybody, welcome back to The Connected Advisor. I'm your host, Kyle Van Pelt, CEO and co-founder of Mile Marker. And today I have the wonderful pleasure of being joined by a gentleman and a scholar, Mark Delato. Uh, Mark is managing partner and COO at Simon Quick Advisors. They are a really unique firm in my perspective because they're kind of this combination of RIA meets family office in a lot of ways. They're doing some innovative things that I'm excited to talk about today. Mark's also pretty involved with his alma mater, Villanova, um, and he does a bunch of really incredible things in the community uh, where he lives in New Jersey that I'm excited to talk about too. So Mark, thanks so much for carving out some time to come on The Connected Advisor. You bet, Kyle. Thanks for having me. Of course, man. So I got to start this the way I started with everybody. I'm always fascinated by how people end up in this industry. Some people, kind of traditional paths, they knew they wanted to do this. Other people, like myself, very circuitous ways of getting into the space. So I always frame this up as asking the question of what is your money moment? Because what I have found is whether you have a traditional path into the industry or a circuitous one, everybody seems to have a moment in their life revolving around personal finance or financial advice that made them go, you know, this is what I want to devote my career to is helping people do this well. So Mark, what is your money moment? So my money moment goes back to when I was a kid. As a young child, I remember my grandfather saying to me pretty frequently, a fool and his money are soon parted. And, you know, he was a product of the Great Depression, that generation that lived through the Great Depression. And, you know, he was a child of an immigrant. He wasn't first gen, but he was very thoughtful and intentional about his money and spend thrift maybe a little <laughs> a little cheap at times but he really understood the value of a dollar maybe we don't appreciate as much these days cuz we're all very fortunate and that to me like still rank like I think of that all the time I say it to my daughters it's really interesting that you know spending is kind of the destruction of wealth and as I've looked at, you know, and worked in the wealth management business, you know, my grandfather speaking that that phrase, it really repeats in my head a lot. That's an incredible money moment. It really is. And, and, and I love telling that story because it keeps me grounded. And my grandfather uh, on my father's side was somebody who he was very quiet and understated. I was a carpenter. And uh, when he said things, they had like meaning and impact. Man, what what a legacy! I hope people say that about me. I hope my grandkids say that about me and stuff when uh when I'm gone and they're and they're doing podcasts like this, however many years from now. <laughs> yeah, exactly, or whatever medium, <laughs> yeah. some holographic AI conversation or something. Yeah. So, okay, I, that actually leads me to another question. You know, that I wasn't planning on asking, but this is why I love doing this because people's answers always spark uh, different questions. So. I grew up with with uh, grandparents who were part of the Great Depression, everything too. Uh, maybe not the exact same story, but I think anybody who lived through the Great Depression and, and survived it was very money conscious. And, you know, our industry has put forth kind of this emphasis on saving, saving for retirement, doing all of these sort of things. And I think that's fantastic. Make no uh, mistake about it. But I've also seen a lot of discussion starting to happen now amongst advisors where people have gotten so good at saving, especially ones who've done well and work with advisors, they don't know how to spend money. So they might be sitting on a big pile of money and you know they still can't pull themselves to go on that vacation or to go do those things. And Mark, we only have one life. It's, it's but a whisper or a wisp or whatever that phrase is, right? Life is short. <laughs> right. So I love that education from your grandfather. I think everybody needs it. But also on the flip side, you know, what are you seeing at Simon Quick? What are you seeing just in general about how do we help people actually spend some of the money they work so hard to save? And they actually, they won, right? They actually won. And now they need to actually enjoy it a little bit or, or do something with it. How would you respond to that? 
Yeah, it's it's a great question. The independent advisor community certainly has been more in tune, I think, with the goals-based planning approach for many, many years now. And and having those kind of deeper meaning conversations around what are you looking to accomplish in life and what are your what are your desires for, you know, whether it's philanthropic giving or whether it's, you know, providing the next generation and beyond with wealth. Those conversations, I think, don't happen as often as they should with with most financial services consumers, right? It's more about the product sell or it's more about, hey, what's going on in the investments and equities world? And let's talk about the latest high flying stock. Those conversations, the softer conversations around what would you like as your legacy? Those don't typically come up in in conversations if you're an advisor or maybe an old school stockbroker, right? If there are still a few around, and there are. But I think, you know, those softer conversations are what's leading the charge to get people to actually enjoy their wealth and enjoy the the spoils and the blessings that that they may have been given in this life. And my wife would definitely tell you that I'm somebody that probably doesn't uh, enjoy the fortunate side of life as much as I should. And, you know, being age 40 now, having a couple of daughters, you know, seeing them grow up, it, you know, as everybody says, it, it happens quickly. And and before you know it, your life's kind of changed and, and you're in different places. And I, I'm sure that will happen again one day when they're, you know, out of college and onto the next phase of life. There are a lot of clients that have really had great careers and fortune and they don't spend it. They don't enjoy it. They don't know what to do with it. That's a curse and a blessing. It's a two-sided coin. I think, you know, certainly though, I look at the the folks that don't control their spending and, and maybe enjoy life a little too much. We don't see those often, but when we do, it is it's definitely it rings true to me. That's when my grandfather's voice starts to pop into my head. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly, I think the majority are, are people who probably are not being smart enough with their money or anything. But I do think it's important that we do raise the conversation that you just eloquently answered is, hey, if you have done well with this, you know, sometimes enjoy it. Have, yeah. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. So that's awesome, man. In the introduction, I kind of Described Simon Quick as this, you know, wonderful hybrid between, you know, maybe a, a traditional RIA and a family office. I don't know if that's a fully fair description. So I want to give you the the chance to get that on record. Like, how would you describe Simon Quick? Because it's not in, when I've talked to you and when I've learned about it, it's not like, you know, the the other RIAs that are out there. You serve very uh, high net worth families. It does have a very sort of family office vibe and move to it. But you guys are also growing quickly, scaling quickly, which is not typically what you see from a family office. So I would love to to hear you talk about that and describe what you think Simon Quick is. It very much was born out of the family office model and an institutional approach. So our, our co-founders, when we started 20 years ago in 04, it was really those co-founders that were using the RIA as their family office and brought in friends and family and institutional not-for-profit and charitable business. And that's kind of how we got to critical mass uh, within the first 18 to 36 months. Over time, we started adapting uh, a more consultative approach towards individuals and families, business owners that were going through complex life events and, and having those founders that have gone through those life events themselves and had to navigate you know, maybe a business sale or a divorce or a generational planning event. And so they could speak peer to peer. And that was really a big part of our value proposition. You know, having these experiences and sharing and having somebody sit by your side and walk together was really a, a big part of who we are and still is today. In addition to that, we've always invested in private assets. So that's a that brings a complexity to our day to day business that Again, not a lot of firms in the industry are doing and and have you know started doing more and more as some of the turnkey platforms have come uh, in the last five years to the market with more alternative investment opportunities. Simon Quick, our average client size is around 10, 10 million. So we're certainly playing in the in the ultra high net worth space. But you know, for us, it really comes down to the client relationship and who we call the ideal client. For us, it's it's somebody that's a business owner 
that has complex needs, somebody that needs advice when it comes to all of the aspects of financial life. And so that's not just the investment portfolio. That is also the tax side. It's also risk, uh, whether that's insurance or otherwise. It's business advice. It's comprehensive life financial advice. And what we really do well, I think, is bring a multi-generational approach on our end to each of our client relationships. So you know, having a partner, a client advisor, and a, an analyst work on every client relationship, the client team is multi-generational and so can appeal to you know, a millennial entrepreneur or maybe that matriarch patriarch of a family that uh, is looking to pass down to the next generation and know that those people are going to be taken care of long term. You got that down. It's like you've been telling the story for a little while. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I am not the business developer here, but I have learned a thing or two on how to tell the story somewhat uh, appealingly. Yeah. So, well, I'm getting there. I, I think one of the reasons I was excited to talk with you is as MileMarker has conversations out in the space on a on a regular basis. I think something that continues to come back is this belief or this hypothesis that RIAs are going to have to look like family offices, you know, post haste, right? You know, there hasn't necessarily been the fee compression, the way the industry said it was going to come, right? That robos were going to take the whatever 100 basis points and turn it into 50 or 30. We haven't seen that, but Michael Kitsis is very astutely pointed out. The fee compression didn't happen on an absolute basis, but the expectation of services went up perhaps for the same amount of fees. And you can't just differentiate anymore by saying that you're a fiduciary fee-only planner. Like everybody has a, a fee-only model, all of this stuff. So what we're seeing is people saying, we've got to offer alternatives. We've got to offer estate planning. We've got to offer tax planning. We've got to, we got to do this whole thing that starts to look to me a lot like a family office model. Um, you all have been doing that for a while. I think, you know, one of the questions I want to ask you is, you know, what challenges come with that? So you you hit a little bit on the private investment side of things, which is just, man, it's operational headache. It's not as easy as dropping an ETF ticker into your rebalancer, things like that, and getting performance reporting and all of that. That's one. But, you know, what other challenges are there in running a, hey, yeah, it's nice to say we're going to offer all these family office services and everything to people, but um, easier said than done, right? So, uh, Yes. The answer is yes to all the above. So many challenges over the years that, look, I mean, uh, to be blunt, like we have not figured it all out yet. There is certainly a number of things that we're looking at, you know, today to solve those complex challenges. Uh, for sure, the margin compression has been there and has been in effect for years. You know, you do have to continue to find ways to add value. And that usually means you know, hiring more people, bringing other services into the mix to help justify those fees that uh, have, for the most part, held true. The complexities of the family office, we merged with uh, a family office in 2017, William E. Simon and Sons. That was my eyes wide open moment when, uh, you know, I saw how the family office did what they did. And it was very valuable to that family, the Simon family, for many, many years. And they wanted to preserve what they were doing. But at the same time, there was a lot of things that needed improvement and efficiency. And, you know, we were building a wealth management firm uh, to scale where I think they were not doing that. And we had to bring that up the curve. And, you know, some of it was certainly people turnover, folks being part of a family office for 30 plus years. It didn't jive with, you know, the RIA that was looking to grow and grow rapidly. So people turnover was a, a part of it, but also, you know, tax returns. So there, we had about 25 years worth of paper tax returns in a file room uh, here in Morristown. You know, project one was how do we how do we digitize all of that? And, uh, you know, we did that. And over time, we just kept chipping away at some of those things that we knew weren't scalable. The, the, the tax returns themselves being done in-house by in-house CPAs. You know, we stopped doing that and outsourced it because we knew that we would get a higher level of knowledge and experience and expertise. And, and certainly, you know, that comes at the expense of maybe, you know, that person that you can turn to. Uh, and the decks go over and ask questions to, but at the same time, it just wasn't scalable. 
And it wasn't something that we were going to offer to our entire client base too. We continue to maintain those returns being done in-house only for family office relationships and legacy relationships. So we continue to find ways to make the offering more efficient and, and more scalable. But it, you know, it is a challenge. We've done some pilot programs on bill pay and offering that out to wealth management clients, some with success, some with you know some pain points along the way. And you're only going to make it better if you try it and if you actually endeavor upon it and uh, make mistakes and learn from those mistakes and apply them going forward. But the family office space is, you know, it's certainly a, an interesting space. But I think the, the 25 million and above client uh, is looking for that level of service and customization, personalization, whatever you want to call it at scale. And that is the challenge for, for Simon Quick, as well as some other folks and service firms in this industry is to build that offering out and, and make it you know as profitable as the wealth management business is. Yeah, well stated again, man. And I think I'm struck by a couple of years ago, if somebody had said, oh, the, the $25 million client is looking for all these things, I probably would have been like, yeah, but that's a pretty small market. But, but if you look at the data, I think that's like the fastest growing kind of segment of client right now, because you're either seeing a bunch of these baby boomers liquidate businesses and, and get into that or you know, tech entrepreneurship and all of these things is just crazy. So you are seeing a lot more people who have $25 million net worths plus that are looking for, you know, this type of thing. And, and I would argue they're looking for the family office services that used to perhaps only be available to people with a hundred million or more. But how do you take care of that 25 to hundred million dollar client? You know, I, I love what you just shared. I think that's incredible. Uh, I mean, we, we, Kyle, just anecdotally, you know, our CFO, was with the family office for 30 plus years. Yeah. And he tells some fantastic stories, uh, some of which uh, I cannot share. But, you know, what he's seen in his time, you know, the hands on approach. And what I mean by that is, you know, you may be a concierge of sorts, which I really detest that term, but the concierge approach to, family office services, I just don't think that that's something that is really scalable. And firms are doing it and more power to them. I think that the 25 million and up client, what they are looking for is not so much concierge, but look, they're looking for a monthly P&L. They want to see where they're spending money. Many of them are business owners and they can understand, you know, they can read financial statements. So they're looking for the monthly P&L. They're looking for, you know, bill pay to take that off of their plate, it's something that's not very high value. But again, if you can provide them with summary statements of their personal wealth and what they're spending money on, that's valuable. That is something that's a value add that traditionally most folks in the industry are not doing. And you have to have that expertise in-house. And by the way, the institutions are not going to do it. So that is where we continue to find opportunities in the space is that there are things that the the traditional brand names are not ever going to do, and that's where you win business. And you know we're not going to win on banking business or pay the highest rates. Both sides have have their their value to them. Certainly, clients with complex lending needs like those are going to be challenges for the RA industry to win. But at the same time, we can win when it comes to some of those niche services that the institutions will not provide. This podcast is brought to you by Termcast. We make game-changing content for fintech and financial services companies. Learn more at turncast.com. Okay, so you talked about something there that I really wanted to ask you about. I think every financial services firm, it's in the name, tries to sell or talk about how great their service is, right? I mean, that that is ultimately what their business is. But but I have seen, and, and the reputation for Simon Quick is that the service at Simon Quick is truly exceptional. What I want to ask you about is that's perhaps expected from a family office because it's literally like you're serving one client or you know whatever. But you also just said, hey, I can't really do concierge level at scale. But I guess my question I want to get to and drill in is, how have you been able to train people to 
you know, kind of achieve that Simon Quick level of service so well. You have this team concept for every client, all of this stuff. But, you know, I don't want to sound like a, a man shaking his fist at the cloud, but I think that the world has gotten exceptionally more casual. I think service standards across the board in our world have kind of gone down. So truly exceptional service always tends to stand out. Um, but you're, you're not finding a lot of people who I guess would say have, have been like trained really well in that aspect. So, so I guess my thought is, or my question is like, what, how is Simon Quick doing that? How are you getting people who aren't just Mark or aren't just, you know, the, the lead advisors or the partners to, to care as much about clients, to care about providing that type of service and to actually follow through on all of it? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And it's something that I frankly don't touch. I don't touch that side of the business but I certainly have heard about it a lot and and I know what the service standards are. And the service standard, simply put, is just excellence. And it permeates from the top. It's always been in our DNA. And I think, again, that starts with Les and Peter and the co-founders of the firm that you have to treat every client like they're the only client. Now, that's challenging. That is really challenging to do. And to some degree, that's why we're able to maintain pricing power and charge a premium because we do deliver on that. It does make it a challenge from a scale perspective, though, certainly. And I think if you're training people the right way, though, certainly at the entry level, you know, they're coming with solutions that I don't know anything about. My knowledge from a technology perspective is not nearly up the curve or what it was when I started here. 17 years ago. You know, what worked then is not going to work now. And I think we constantly are looking to improve. And that constant improvement is what makes us better and, and competitive in the in the environment. If you're not looking to improve, if you're looking to just keep doing things, you, you think you figured it out, you're wrong. I mean, it's, it's, everybody kind of knows that, I think, hopefully. The training that's done, I really credit our next generation here who you know, I was the myself and another colleague of mine, one of my closest friends growing up, we were very fortunate when we got here to be given opportunities. And we've tried to pay that forward and, and give the generation three, the G3, that opportunity as well. And not just, you know, from a responsibility perspective, but an ownership perspective as well. And that I think that is what distinguishes how people think the ownership mentality everyone knows is different when you actually own a piece of the business. There is just an intrinsic value there that you cannot replicate through a base and bonus. It's just different. And so that, you know, opportunity of, of ownership was, was granted to myself and my colleague, Chris, and, and we've you know been big advocates for that. And less Peter, Joe Belfato, the founders of the firm that have, uh, you know, helped us get to where we are today and that want to see this business perpetuate forward. They have been very generous in helping us grow and helping the ownership population grow as well. Awesome, man. That's a great answer. And I appreciate you kind of Thank being you. forthcoming of like, hey, that's not necessarily my department, but I've seen how it works because that is just yeah. something that just stands out to me is how do people train great service? I, I have a lot of friends who work at uh, Chick-fil-A corporate too, for example. And I'm like, how do you guys do it? Like, how are you getting, you know, tens of thousands of people to meet the standard? And so I, I appreciate the answer there. It's it's a generational, you know, change as well, where maybe the responsiveness of my father's generation or, or Les's generation was, you pick up the phone. Well, you still, you can pick up the phone in other ways. It's not just picking up the phone, but hey, by the way, picking up the phone is still a decent thing to do. And it's a lost art, but it does work on occasion. You, know, you have to know your client, but you know not everyone gravitates towards the phone calls these days, but it does, it does matter. And so responsiveness and responsive time is definitely something that we instill in everyone here. Being responsive is important. That's service quality is what distinguishes us from the competition. Yeah, love it. Okay. We've talked a lot about the human element. Uh, you mentioned technology. You know me. Yep. We, we run a technology firm. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about it. Um, yeah. I know you have a lot of technology that you like, but I want to frame this question in this way. like With the model that you have and the way Simon Quick works and the way that Mark is trying to put everything together at scale, like where's the biggest gap 
in your tech stack right now? Like, where have you not really been able to find a solution that it's like, oh, this problem continues to persist and we just can't seem to find a partner or a piece or a vendor or something? Um, and I apologize for the flood of emails you're going to get after this answer from people saying, Mark, I've got exactly that solution for you. But uh, solution. Yep. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, answer it however you think. Best. Yeah. Well, first off, I'm I'm not a technologist by background, as I mentioned earlier. You know, I, I grew up uh, in the business more, uh, you know, started out on the, on the on the sell side. And and really, as I worked through my career, I picked up the technology side. And I led it and did my best. But I think the biggest gap for us is on the tech side and the infrastructure of the organization and tying all the pieces together as a small enterprise. You know, we we certainly, you know, over time have outgrown some of the tools that we've used and we've upgraded and, you know, we've looked at best in breed. We've looked at the all in ones. To me, it, it all comes down right now at this point to data and just data quality, single source of truth, where is everything and how can we get it? And uh, it's still a challenge for us. And that's what I've been focused on, you know, probably the last three to four months is how can we improve on that? What can we do to make that more of a focus, more of a priority? When I think about people culling together, you know, various spreadsheets from various systems, it makes me want to cry. Because I know other firms are doing it much easier and, and much better. And one of the reasons that we we picked up the phone and talked to you guys was, hey, help us, you know, with this data problem that we've got. You know, we're still in progress. I mean, it's it's not something that you figure out overnight either, by the way. Over time, we've, you know, we've built out silos. And, and these silos are great for each department, but none of it speaks to each other. And so we need to do a better job of tying it all together. That's the big, you know, the big initiative on my plate for this year and beyond. Yeah. Let the record show, I did not pay Mark to say that. I actually had no idea he was going to share that. Um, candidly, I expected Mark to talk about something in the alternative investment space. So I am very appreciative <laughs> that you said, hey, the problem mile marker solves is the big problem that Simon Quick deals with. Like, it is. It's real. We're, it we're is. hearing that from, from firm after firm after firm. And if it does make you feel better, there's still a lot of people culling together spreadsheets and trying to make spreadsheets the source of truth. And uh, they know there's got to be a better way. There definitely is. One of the things that, I think about is just the pace of technological change. And we're seeing it now with, with AI for sure. But the pace of change is so rapid. I mean, it's changed so much in the last five to seven years. It's exciting to see because there are so many endless possibilities uh, and potential for things that this industry in particular does a really poor job of when it comes to <laughs> efficiency and data and utilization of technology. I think that we don't do nearly enough training. I think our utilization percentage uh, across our tech stock is low. That's the industry, that's not just us either, you know, our firm. This is a industry-wide issue that we continue to grapple with. At the same time though, we're starting to see doors open that have never opened yeah. up before to make advisors more efficient, to not be doing things so manually. And the more that we find those opportunities and work at them, the more it'll open up time for those real conversations that we talked about earlier. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I'm excited about a lot of the possibilities that are there too. It's also interesting because, you know, we keep seeing people who are like, well, we want to do AI, but we also, you know, we're a regulated industry. There's a lot of, th we can't just be throwing our data out into these open large language models and all of that. So people are like, wow, we really do have to get our data right if we want to do anything meaningful with AI and a lot of these advancements that you're talking about. So Absolutely. Well stated. I couldn't that. agree more. So Mark, I know that you are pretty involved in nonprofits. As somebody who's who's involved with a nonprofit as well, I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about that, where that originated from and, and what makes you passionate about it. So I have a brother, Peter, with Down syndrome. Peter's 48 years old. He lived uh, at home with my parents for many years. I'm actually really happy to say, uh, moved into a group home environment recently uh, in 2023, which, you know, with, with aging parents is, it's really difficult. It's difficult for them 
to see their child outside of their out of their purview. And for me, as as a a sibling, oh, it gives me solace in knowing that he's going to be you know well taken care of for uh, the foreseeable future. And Peter has uh, severe Down syndrome, so he has. 24 hours, seven day week care. He needs help with everything, uh, nourishment, bathing, uh, you name it. He's nonverbal. So I worked with an organization called the Ark of Morris. My parents were involved in it like 40 years ago when it was still a grassroots type of uh, chapter at the local level. The Ark itself has been around nationally for over 50 years now, but the real, you know, local level was still in its very nascent stages when they were involved. I've been involved in the, the organization uh, at the chapter uh, county level here for about seven years, and you know, I've served in treasurer function. I've served in as general director, and just seeing the organization go through challenges, business challenges at a, at a much different you know, perspective though. And I've been able to add value in terms of thinking through the business end of it, the people end of it, staffing and organizational strategy, you know, long-term thinking. It's very rewarding though. And we had an executive director retire during COVID. That was a challenge to go through search during COVID. We found an outstanding uh, replacement and he is really taking it to the next level in terms of developing the the chapter and building out more services, more programs for those in need. And it serves a population of folks that have developmental disabilities across the spectrum. So again, very re- rewarding work and it's definitely close to home. Man, that's so cool. I love, I love hearing you share that. All right. I want to move into uh, what we call the mile marker minute. So this is a lightning round questions. I'm going to ask you a handful of them. The goal is to try and have all the questions answered in a minute or less, but it's not a hard and fast rule. Uh, So are you up to the task? I'm ready. All right. First question. As a Villanova grad, you know, we are recording this on the, the verge of March Madness. How are you feeling about Villanova's chances this year in the March Madness tournament? Mm, lukewarm lukewarm i <laughs> love it okay where uh would you like to travel in the world that you have not been yet oh that's a good one i would like to travel to france france i love it if you could not work in the financial advice space for a career what would you be doing instead music music what instrument do you play guitar oh i love it uh are you ta- taylor or are you uh oh go ahead I, I like Taylor Swift. I think she's great. Oh, oh fantastic. So you're calling Taylor Swift. I was going to say, do you play a Taylor? Are you playing a Martin? Are you oh, play a Taylor. Oh, no, no, no. I play a Fender Strat. Oh, Fender Strat. Okay. I'm pretty plain vanilla. Love it. That's fantastic, man. Um, <laughs> I thought you were going to ask me, what you know, what are my thoughts on Taylor Swift? I got, I got two girls. I, I asked the, only, the only right answer is I love her. Yeah. My, uh, my business partner says Taylor Swift is now an asset class in his portfolio is the, is the <laughs> way that he puts it. Um, I think that's a great place to wrap up, man. Uh, fun, fun lightning round question there. I do hope that your Nova Wildcats do well in March Madness. Um, we'll see how it I'm is. going to see them play tonight with my daughters and my wife. So it's amazing They're playing at the rock versus the, the Seton Hall Pirates. So what? hopefully, hopefully a win tonight. Yeah, hopefully, man. Well, thank you so much for carving out time and coming on the show. Um, People often hear me say time is a gift and uh, I'm always appreciative of you gifting us with your time. And it was an incredible conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kyle. I really appreciate it as well. And I hope everyone got something out of it. Yeah, I think they did. Um, Okay, everybody, this has been another episode of The Connected Advisor. Thanks so much for tuning in. Make sure to hit that follow or subscribe button wherever you are listening to this so you can catch the next great episode like we just had with Mark. And we will see you next time. Thanks.